107. Here we go. Are you ready? And I love this chapter. I really do. And Frank was talking about um, revival, national revival and local revival, all the way down to the family having revival. And I thought, I was thinking about this passage early this morning as uh, we headed this direction. And this is a different Bible than the one I normally use, but I have this message jotted down in this one. So we'll try to be a blessing to you today. Look at verse number one of Psalm 107. And I, I want you to look for a pattern, okay? Uh, you, know, you know, a pattern is something that you can see similarities throughout a course of a period of time how uh, things repeat themselves or how things look similar throughout a, a period of time. I want you to, as, you, as we read this together and you read it in your mind, I want you to look for a pattern in this passage of Scripture. Here we go. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go into a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul, and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Because they rebelled against the words of the Lord, and condemned the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor, they fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Now, has anybody recognized the pattern yet? Let's keep going. Verse 14. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. Has anybody seen the pattern yet? Can I get a few nods? All right. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're starting. We're going up and down, right? We're starting off. Everybody's praising the Lord, and then we end up doing what? Crying because we're in trouble. Let's keep going. We see it one more time. Verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. He delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would. What's the next three words? Praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships, they do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up, the heaven, they mount up to the heaven. They go down again into the depths. Their soul is melted because of what? Trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they what? Cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. He maketh the storm a calm. Look at verse 30. Then are they glad because they are quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. Please help us as we dig into this very simple concept and help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, you see a roller coaster here, right? They're praising the Lord, things are going good, and then God allows some kind of test to come their way. There are testings that we experience there are trials that we experience and uh, then there are temptations that we experience you understand those three categories and probably all of us in here are within one of those three a test a trial or a temptation a temptation is to sin right you if you're tempted and you follow through with that then you sin now if you're tempted and you don't follow through with it then you've not sinned right so some of you here today you may be under a temptation you may have experienced something Last night that is tempting you to do the wrong thing. 
You may have experienced something today that is tempting you to do the wrong thing. We all go through temptations, and that's the devil. And that's our flesh working with one another. Then there's the testings that we go through, and that is where God allows us or sends us a storm or a test to take, and we either pass it or we fail it. And some people say that God does that so that he can know what we're made out of. I have a problem with that. God doesn't need to know what we're made of because he already knows what we're made of. For example, God knows that we're physically made out of dirt, right? He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The very first man was made out of dirt. And so God knows that we're all born of woman, few days and full of trouble. We're all, our frame is made out of dirt. We're made out of dust. We come from dust and therefore we are prone to making mistakes. But every now and then, God will send us a test, okay? Now, okay, you know, as you evaluate your children, you look at your children and you think, okay, well, this one needs work in this area and this child needs work in this area. And you try to help your children get through life. Every now and then, you'll give them something to do as a test. Or as a school teacher, you may give a student a test. Or as an employer, you may give one of your employees something as a test in their journey. It benefits the one that's giving the test, right? So God gives me a test for his benefit. Well, eventually it will be because if I pass the test, it will be for his honor and glory. But for the most part, if God gives me a test, it's for my benefit. And that is so that I can know what I can handle. In other words, God issues a test for me. He sends a storm my way. He sends a test my way. And I can either choose to embrace God and make it through or I can fail and in the end I look back and say wow the Lord helped me through that or in the end I look back and say wow I really messed it up that's the test so there are temptations and there are tests and then there are trials these are things that we experience throughout life that come out of nowhere it seems you don't really understand why you're experiencing these kind of things are seen in this chapter and I want to look at Four different categories, or four areas in this chapter where we see a pattern like this. And it's a nation, right? The nation of Israel. And we can look at this and compare it to our own country. How that we're doing the same thing, right? We go up and down, we go up and down. Something really bad happens and everybody becomes a Christian real quick, right? Oh, God, help us. Oh, we're, forgive us for what we've done. Lord, help us. And, and then they go back to their drinking and their carousing and their partying and their carrying on. People become spiritual when it will benefit them. And that's the exact opposite of what God would desire for us. God wants us to be spiritual to benefit Him and His cause and His reason for life. So let's look at this. The first thing, and this is what I call roaming on the range, a complete waste of time. Look here in verses 4 through 6. They wandered in the wilderness. In a solitary way, they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Okay, so let's see. The first time we see them going up and down was because they were wasting their time. Now, the children of Israel had the opportunity to skip that whole 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They had that opportunity of... See, if they had just obeyed God and did exactly what he wanted them to do, they could have been prepared for the promised land. But God did not allow them to do that. They had to wander in the wilderness because of their disobedience. All too often we find ourselves wandering around, wasting time as Christians, not getting anywhere with God, not getting anywhere in our individual ministries, not getting anywhere in life. We feel like we're spinning our wheels and running backwards. And we're trying to figure out, why is this happening to me? Well, the pattern begins in this psalm because these people disobeyed God and therefore he let them do their own thing. If you come to realize that when you find yourself in a complete waste of time, wandering around in the desert of life, wandering, wasting your life away in a wilderness, you'll oftentimes see that if you'll go back and find the place where you could obey what God told you to do, it would repurpose you in your life. There are people all throughout the Bible that ended up wasting their entire lives. And you trace it back and try to figure out, okay, why, did, why was Saul's life such a waste? Because he disobeyed God. 
Why did Solomon, the greatest man that ever lived, get to the end of his life and call his life a waste of vanity and vexation of spirit? Read the book of Ecclesiastes. A man that died in complete defeat, and yet he was the wisest and richest man that ever lived. Why did he feel defeated? Because there were so many times throughout his life that he told God no. Wandering in the wilderness, roaming on the range, wasting their time. It says they were hungering and thirsting. But what were they hungry and thirsting for? Oh, I want, I want, I want. Give me, give me, give me. I need this, I need this. Now God gave them what they needed. But all too often they were hungry and thirsty for the wrong thing. See, uh, the, the real contentment is not wanting something that you don't have, but being thankful for that which God has given you to keep. And we're not content anymore. As a nation, we're not content. America just wants more and more. Give me, give me, give me, give me more. I'm entitled to this. I deserve this. I have a right to this. Which God is looking for a nation, a state, a county, a community, a family, one individual. God is seeking today one person that will say, I don't care about my life anymore. I don't care about what I want. It's not about what I want. It's about what God wants. And therefore, I'm going to do everything within my entire being to obey God and do what He wants. At that point, you'll no longer be wandering around in the wilderness. At that point, verse number 6, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their, what? Distresses. God is waiting he doesn't want you to live a, a wasted life. By no means. I have found myself in the middle of self-inflicted trials that lasted for years. And all God was doing was waiting on me to obey. They called upon the Lord. They cried unto the Lord and he delivered them out of their distresses. Look at the second time we see this pattern repeat itself. Not only roaming on the range, but then there's rebelling at the Redeemer. Look at verse number 11. Because they, what? Rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. Now this is interesting. We first saw them roaming on the range, completely wasting their time, wasting their life. Then God bailed them out. Then again, we see them rebelling at the Redeemer. Not only are they disobeying God's simple command, but they're going the exact opposite direction. Okay? And here's the example, okay? If I say, uh, let's, let's try to come up with a really, really good practical kind of thing. Okay? Adam and Eve. Ready? Adam and Eve. And God says to Adam and Eve, Do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know, men, they get so excited about that because the women messed it up really bad, right? That's, what, that's, our, that's our excuse. Oh, the woman, she, she was the first one to sin. She, she, she disobeyed God first. And Adam, he was just trying to help her. You know, he was like he always does. Always the man's trying to bail his wife out. You know, men, they try to get real goofy about that. But the fact of the matter is, had he taken on the responsibility that God gave him to be with her and not be doing his own thing, it would not have been so easy for the devil to beguile Eve. So let's think about this. God said, don't eat it. That down the grapevine translated back to the serpent that we're not supposed to touch it. Now, God didn't say we weren't supposed to touch it. He said we weren't supposed to eat it. So there was a stretch that took place here. And guess what happened? The exact opposite happened. The rebellion started when she bit into that fruit and did exactly the opposite of what God told her to do. God said, leave it alone. Do not eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. And she did the exact opposite. And we do the same thing. God says, don't go here. And rather than avoiding that place, we end up proactively wanting to go there and chasing after that because that's the thing that we don't want to do. And people are made out, and our sin nature naturally desires those things. So they got themselves into trouble 
because they were rebelling against the words of God. Okay? God told, remember, God told uh, Moses, He said, Speak to the rock. And Moses, in his anger, took his stick and struck the rock. That was just one example of rebellion against what God told him to do. Look at the progression here from God's orders to man's disobedience to man's rebellion in that story of Moses and the rock. God said, Moses, speak to the rock. Moses disobeyed by not speaking to the rock. That was his disobedience. Well, that would have been one thing. But then they were in much more trouble because the third level came in. He could have obeyed. He disobeyed. Then number three, he rebelled by taking that stick in an act of defiance against God Almighty, struck the rock. Not only did he disobey by not speaking to it, but he rebelled by doing his own thing, an action that was the exact opposite of what God told him to do. So we do the same thing. God gives us something to do because we fear it or because we don't want to do it or because it doesn't agree with our flesh or because we don't have time for it. We do our own thing and in direct disobedience to God, we become rebellious. But then look at what he says here. I love how that God bails them out. Okay? Because they rebelled against the words of God, verse 11, and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. God in turn, and as a result of their rebellion, was their life easier? Oh, let's strike the rock and get some water out of it. They got water out of it, but did that make their life easier? Nope. No, it didn't make Moses' life easier by striking that rock. Did he get the water? Yeah, he got the water, but he ended up ro roaming around for 40 years and ended up dying without even getting to go in the promised land because of his disobedience and his rebellion. Oh, and by the way, did Moses' actions only affect himself? Nope. What Moses did affected 2 million other people. We live in such a small little box. We think, as long as I take care of myself, that's really all that matters. As long as I end up being what I need to be, it really nothing else really matters. No, because what you do affects everybody else around you. And in this particular case, we see a man that because of his disobedience, his dishonoring God and his rebellion, it affected an entire nation of people for a very, very long time. But thank God for verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Now, we saw roaming on the range and rebelling at the Redeemer. Number three, ruining in the rot. Look here at verse number 17. You ready? They do it again. Look at verse 17. What's the first word of verse 17? Somebody read it. Fools. Say it again. Fools. fools. Why were they fools? Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. I'm talking about when we first started in this team, this, this uh, pattern, we just had a bunch of people want, roaming on the range, you know, just kind of walking around wasting their time because they didn't want to do what God said. And then the second time we saw the pattern repeat itself, we just saw somebody with a stick beating on a rock or doing the exact opposite of what God told them to do. Nothing really, really, really bad. But now you get into the third level of this thing and you find yourself completely ruining in the rot. Fools because of their transgression. Now, sinning is bad enough. Sinning is when you uh, do something that is against the Bible or do something wrong. That's a sin, okay? Telling a lie, you know. Uh, the other day, I completely walked out of a store. Uh, where was we at? I can't remember what happened. I had something in my hand, and I, I was talking to the lady about it. I can't remember where I was at. I walked out. I had talked to her about this product, and she never charged me for it. I walked out the door, and I still had the thing in my hand. And I, I said, wait a minute. She didn't take my money. And I walked back in, and she scanned it. took the, It was a, a, a little store, a little shop there. It could have been very easy for me to have used her oversight and pocketed that thing and went home with it. But would that have been right? No, that would have been a sin. That would have been like a, a little, a little, you know, little one. Little, little one. 
you know. And people say, all sin is the same. I'm sorry, but that right there is not as bad as me taking a baseball bat and beating an old lady with it. I mean, that's not as bad, right? You understand? All sin is sin, but that right there would be bad, and I would have blackness in my heart because of it, but the result would not be the same if I'd take a baseball bat and beat an old lady with it. You understand that? Somebody help me, please. Y'all are asleep. Come on now. I'm almost done here. So I had that thing, and I went back in, and I paid for it, and it was a done deal, and I, I'm forgiven, and all's, all's, all's done. It's her mistake, my mistake, we fixed it. But here you got people that are transgressing because of their iniquities, and they're afflicted. What does all that mean? There's a lot of big words in the King James Bible, a lot of big ones. Let's look at it like this. That sin would have been me taking that thing, pocketing it, and going home with it. That would have been a sin. An iniquity would be me saying, wait a minute, that woman doesn't know what she's doing. I'm going to go back in there and try to get me some more stuff. Go back in and talk to her. How's the weather? Nice hairdo. Your grandchildren like it? That's uh, well, it's some neat stuff over here. Go ahead and help that other customer. I'll be back in a minute. And I fill my pockets full and walk out the door. That's an iniquity. It's just a little bit worse. Here's a transgression. Transgression is I call Brother Frank. Brother Frank, we could really cash in tonight. Get some baskets and some bags and some wheelbarrows. And what we'll do is we'll get her distracted and we'll just clean the whole place out. Come on, man. Let's go. Frank comes over. We're walking around the store. and I get my three-year-old. Carson, Carson, stand here and talk to this lady. And she just goes berserk over Carson. <laughs> just pinching and laughing and giggling. Me and Frank are cleaning out the place. We take it out. We fill the car with it. Four or five trips. We got $20,000 worth of stuff. You understand the progression? It went from just this little bitty thing, right? Now what do we got? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The police show up. I'm robbing the store. I've got pockets full of money. And my three-year-old is there. And I brought Frank into it. And I've destroyed so many people's lives. And we're going to jail. I lose my kid. And the cops show up. And I get belligerent with the police officers. And guess what? I get shot. Sin, when it's... Oh, but it just started with I just missed one thing on the receipt. So you understand how this progression goes? If we excuse a little bitty sin, before you know it, it can be a transgression that has completely ruined our lives. And the first word of the verse is what? Say it again. Fools. I have become a fool. Because I let something little bitty take me down a slippery slope that I could not climb back out of. Are y'all following me? But once again, God bailed them out. Look here at verse number... 19, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. You know, we're a whole lot meaner than God is. You know that? And I, something happened this past week with a person that I know that did something really bad, and he repeated it over and over and over and over again over the course of the past 15 years. And every time he would come back and apologize, and everybody would forgive him, and it would be over with, and he'd do it again, and he'd apologize. And Y'all know people like that. You got somebody in your mind right now you're thinking of that does that. And uh, so I asked a, pre a preacher friend of mine this past week. I said, "How many times do you? How many times do you just let yourself get run over? Forgiveness is one thing. The Bible says a true gauge of spirituality is if you have the ability to reinstate somebody that has fallen by the wayside. Let's hear the verse. Remember, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a Fault, ye which are spiritual, what's the next word? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. So in other words, if so-and-so makes a terrible, horrible mistake and commits a horrible sin, it's not my job to take him and throw him under the bus and kick dirt on him. It's my responsibility to take him out to breakfast and say, hey, listen, man, you need, you need to, what's going on in your life? Come back to church. 
Come back and get in the altar and, and pray and ask God to help you. Let's pray together here at the breakfast table. Let's figure out a way to get you some help. That's what restoration is. God has so many times. And in this chapter, this is the third time he does it. But then he does it again. Look at verse number 27. We'll close with this one. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their what? Wits end. Did you know that phrase was in the Bible? That's where it comes from, right there. At my wits end. Anybody in here when you were a kid listened to Adventures in Odyssey? Am I the only one that did that? Okay. Wits end was a place where people could go and get ice cream and snacks. and That's not what wits end is in the Bible. Wits end is a place where you are... You have lost all control. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. Even when me and Frank and three-year-old Carson were robbing that poor old lady in her store, we still had control, didn't we? When you step out of that and you've gone, you have, okay, what did we start it? All the way back here at the very beginning, wasting our time, wandering aimlessly, a waste of time. And then after we're roaming on the range, we're rebelling at the Redeemer, then we're ruining in the rot, and now we're reeling in the rave. What does that mean? That means you're just going back and forth and back and forth, and but you have no control. So you've lost all control. And once you get to that point, you've lost all control, it's almost as though you've gone too far, and only God is going to be able to fix you. I don't know where you are today, I would rather God fix me back here in verse 6 and stay there. I, I, don't, I want wasting my time and wandering in the wilderness to be the worst part that I experience. I don't ever want to get so far that I'm completely out of control. And that's what happened. They were staggering like a drunken man. No more control. I don't know which level you're at today. But even if you're at level 4 where you're staggering like a drunken man? Look at verse 28. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Now, I'll close with this. Each time you see these verses where they cried unto the Lord and he delivers them and brings them out, each time you see that, the word means something a little different. Look at verse 28. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he, what? Bringeth them out. What does that mean? That means to bring out. I looked it up. It means to bring out. That's pretty easy. Bring it out. Bring out. Bring out the groceries, son. Carry them out here. Bring them out of the grocery store. Put them in the car. Bring out the firewood. Get it out of the storage area and bring it into the house here. Pile it up next to the fireplace. Bring out, bring out. That means to go in and get something out. When you are completely out of control, it takes God to come into your situation and bring you out. You cannot do it on your own. They, did, they weren't able to bail themselves out. God had to bring them. If you're here today and you think that you've destroyed your life and you think that somehow you're going to be able to fix your own life, it doesn't work like that. If a Dodge breaks down on the side of the road, it's not going to fix itself. If a Toyota breaks down, it's not going to fix itself. If a Chevy breaks down, it's not going to fix itself. Some of y'all are getting mad at me. I gotta... If a Ford breaks itself, it's not going to fix itself. You understand? It has to be brought to the place to be fixed, or it has to be fixed on site by something or someone else. Are y'all following me? Bring it them out. Look at verse 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he what? Saveth, Saveth them out of their distresses. S-A-V-E-T-H. That means over and over and over and over, he saveth, which the word here, saveth, means to liberate. Yes! I've been a transgressor. I've been a, a, a person committing iniquity. I've been a sinner, but God has liberated me and broken me free from my sinful condition. God can do that, right? Let's go back one more step and look what the next word means. Okay, we saw he brings us out. He saveth us to liberate us. 
But then we see the word saved here. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he what? Saved them out of their distresses. What does that word mean? If you look it up, that word saved means to have victory. You see the progression here as we go backwards? It starts out with God bringing you out. Then God sets you free. Then God gives you victory over these things that you're uh, facing. He saves us. He gives us the victory. And that's what that word means. But the very first one, as we go backwards, it's the last one. Look at what he says in verse 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he what? Delivered them. Delivered them out of their distresses. Now, I really like this part. And you can say, well, that's way too far-fetched. Well, that's because that's the reason you're not getting blessed today, because you think the Bible is too far-fetched. The word delivered, anybody want to guess what that means? If you look it up, study, dig it, take it apart, look it up. It literally means, delivering means to snatch away. Well, what else means to snatch away? You want to take a wild guess? When you talk about the rapture, that means a catching away or a snatching away or, or a deliverance. I believe ultimately for God's people, even though we may have trouble and even though we may have a, a hard time living it, whether it's self-inflicted or God just allowing us to be tested, the ultimate deliverance is when the Lord comes and snatches us out of here. That's the ultimate deliverance. Yes, we'll be delivered out of this trial, but guess what's coming tomorrow? Another trial. Yeah, we may be, my dad, God love him, he's down there on the beach experiencing victory and deliverance. But what's going to happen a week from Monday? He'll go right back into the trial again. We all go through periods of life where we're like this, right? But when we get snatched out of here, there won't be no more of this. It'll just be this. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I'm ready for the ultimate deliverance. We need the daily deliverance that comes from each one of these steps. And I hope today that if you're at level number one and you're wasting your life, that you'll stop that and listen to God and obey God. But I hope that if you're taking that next step and you've rebelled against God, that you'll stop at that point and let God bring you out of that. But even if you've completely transgressed and become a fool, I hope that you'll stop at that point and let God deliver you. But even if you haven't and if you've gone so far as to being out of control, that today will be the day that you stop and let God have control. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. Please help us to accept your deliverance and your victory and the daily grace and help that comes in the time of trouble. And we will be careful to thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we'll just wait just a moment. If you need to use this altar, it's open. Anybody that would like to come. So I don't, I'm at step.